Chapter 1, To Whom Fate Smiles, 535th Cycle of the Seventh Age, 16 Cycles Later. Storm stood atop the edge of a floating world, the wind of the skies rustling through his black hair. Far beyond a swirl of clouds, the sun was just peeking her face into existence. He felt her warmth touch his cheeks as she rose higher, and for a long moment, he simply watched. Turning his back to the rising sun, Storm walked over to a tree standing not far from the cliff. About 30 paces to the side of the tree was a wooden cabin with faint traces of smoke rising from a chimney. It was his home, the only home he had ever known. The floating island he lived on wasn't much bigger than the cabin in their one tree. In fact, the cabin itself seemed to take up the majority of the island. Regardless, Storm was content and wished for nothing grander. And even if he did get a little stir-crazy in the small space, all it took was one glance to the north and Storm's eyes would fall upon Falia, his birthplace, a nation of Earth sitting amongst the clouds. The place infamously known, infamously known as the Edge was only a hundred paces away from where he stood, and not far beyond that, he could see the dark trees of Neverend Forest looming tall and mighty. Taking off his dark hooded jacket, Storm hung it on one of the branches of the tree feeling the touch of the morning breeze across his bare chest. Shards of black bone, native to all Saurians, grew out of the skin over his ribs like an exoskeleton, along with certain parts of his wrists and shoulders. And hanging from his neck was a simple silver chain. Leaning against the tree trunk was a leaden training sword, charcoal in color, but with no edge. With a few deep breaths, Storm lifted the sword off the ground, wincing under its weight. He hadn't been able to lift the sword at all until he was 14 cycles old, a triumph that still shined brightly within his memories. A few feet to his right was a thin metal rod sticking out of the ground with a dozen steel rings slipped over the top of it. With the careful ease of someone lifting a heavy object, Storm picked up one of the rings and slid it over the tip of his sword. It fell down to the guard with a thump, and he felt the weight of the sword double. Lifting another ring in the same fashion, Storm continued placing them onto his weapon until three of the rings had fallen against the guard of his sword. Using both hands now to lift it, Storm walked to the side of the tree and searched for his focus. Closing his eyes, he raised the sword above his head and brought it down slowly, stopping with it held out in front of him. He continued in this fashion, one fluid motion at a time, carefully, meticulously. As the shades passed, the motion of Storm's movement became more and more fluent. The sun rose higher into the sky, causing beads of sweat to streak down his body. And as his steady slashes became more controlled, the speed of his swing began to increase. With each slash, the leaves of the tree began to ripple in his wake, and the dirt at his feet began to swirl and twist as if taking on the essence of the wind. 994, Storm said, hearing the strain of his aching body through his voice. 995, he continued, the hilt of the sword drenched in sweat. Closing his eyes, Storm felt a sudden presence from the trees of Neverend. Relaxing his muscles, he could see the aura of somebody moving towards him. Over the course of his grandfather's training, he had learned about the nine senses of the Saurians, but one had intrigued him far more than the others. It was the ability to see the energy of living things, their life force, or in the words of his old man, their aura. At first, Storm could only feel aura when it was close to him, but as the cycles passed, he began to feel it from further and further distances, until he could sense a crystal fly from almost 200 paces away. It was a technique that was an absolute necessity for hunter hunting within the dangerous Neverend Forest. With his eyes closed, Storm could see and feel the same world, but through a different lens. The aura of living things glowed like flame, exactly like the one that was approaching from Neverend. Storm opened his eyes and continued his sword training as an old man with a long sweeping cloak walked out of the trees. 998, Storm said coolly, feeling the presence of the old man touch down behind him. He could hear him walking closer and knew that his grandfather saw the little things in everything. He could pick out poor technique by the simple sound of it, and he had an uncanny knack for feeling the tension of someone who was pained by fatigue. 999, Storm said feeling the pride of nearing his goal. The old man merely stood and watched, saying nothing. His body was lean and muscled, 
the stature of one who had trained their entire life. His face was expressionless but soft, and though it might be hard to see in a first glance, he was proud of his grandson's determination. In one of his hands he held a bundle of firewood, and slung over one of his shoulders was a long metal box, rectangular in shape, and the length of it reached nearly all the way to his feet. One thousand, Storm said triumphantly, feeling a smile tug at the corner of his lips. Taking a few deep breaths, he lifted the sword and rested it against his shoulder, turning around. He took in the sight of the old man, with his long black hair and thick beard. Around his waist, he wore a once crimson sash, torn and discolored from cycles of use. Beneath his faded cloak, Storm could see the many tattoos that littered the left side of the old man's chest. You shouldn't let the presence of something else distract you, Storm, the old man said. Losing your focus is worse than being tired. Storm ignored him and walked over to the metal rod, taking off each of the rings and placing them back where they belonged. He tried to appear nonchalant as he lifted them off the sword, but truth be told, he could hardly lift them at all. Gently resting the training sword back against the tree, he reached up and pulled his jacket down off the branch. Storm turned around to see the old man placing the bundle of firewood down next to the cabin. He caught sight of the metal box slung over his shoulder, and for a brief moment he questioned what it could be especially with it being the size that it was. The old man hardly ever brought anything back from the town other than wine. I didn't get distracted, Ronan, Storm finally said. I was just noticing the difference in the presence of the area. Didn't you say that swordsmen should not only be focused, but aware? Ronan held back a smile. I suppose I've said something of the sort. He looked up at the placement of the sun, wiping a few beads of sweat from his forehead. Where's your brother? It's past noon. Storm rolled his eyes. Where do you think he is? He walked over to the back side of the cabin where two large leather water skins hung from the side of the wall. The top of each water skin was carefully attached to wooden pipes that ran inside the cabin. Protruding out of the back of each one was a little fountain head with a lever for turning on or off. Hanging his jacket on a hook to the left of them, Storm twisted one of the levers and felt a rush of cold water run onto his hands. Splashing his face, Storm placed his hands back down, but the run out of water had slowed to a drip. Sighing, Storm tried the second water skin. A few moments later, Ronan heard Storm's voice from behind the cabin. Oi, we're out of water again, Storm called. Ronan turned to see Storm walking around the corner. His hair was wet and hanging down in front of his eyes. He stood shirtless with a look of irritation on his face. Ronan shrugged. Go and wake up your brother then. You two will have to get going if you're gonna return with water by nightfall. And judging by the time, you won't be able to hike all the way to Cineria Lake. You'll have to do it the hard way. Storm pursed his lips. You know I've been training since dawn, right? Ronan carefully placed the long metal box down on the ground. That was your choice, was it not? I mean, yeah, said Storm. But you said our final swordsmanship test is in a week. So I figure you would expect us to be training as hard as we could. Ronan nodded his head. Still turned away. And we also agreed that it is both of your responsibilities to get water whenever we need it. Or has my memory withered? It just might have at your age, Storm muttered. Ronan looked up. What was that? Nothing, Storm answered. His eyes glanced back to the side of the cabin. I swear we just did this like a week ago, Storm pondered out loud. Are you concerned you won't be able to make the climb in your fatigued condition, Ronan asked, the slightest bit of a grin unmasking itself. I'm pretty sure I could still take you on, even in my fatigue condition, Storm said, meaning Ronin's gaze. Ronin laughed. A thousand slashes in six, in six shades, huh? He looked over at the grass beneath the tree. And you didn't let the ring slip off the end of the sword once, either. Storm felt his pride swelling. That's right, Storm said. A thousand slashes. When you get to ten thousand in three shades without dropping the rings, you might have a chance of beating me, Ronin said turning away once again. We'll see about that, Storm said. We will, said Ronan, but it won't be before you wake your brother and fill the water skins. Storm's eyes sharpened, but he nodded his head. Walking over to the draped bamboo doorway to the cabin, Storm kneeled down and took off his boots. Pushing past the trickling wooden drapes, Storm walked into their little home. The remnants of a fire burned softly in a stone fireplace. There was a single wooden table low enough that the three of them could sit on the ground and eat, or read, and hanging from the ceiling was a hammock built of grass and rope. 
Just above the hammock was a little glass doorway in the ceiling that could be used to let fresh air in at night, or to give Ronan easy access to the roof where he liked to sit and drink his wine. It wasn't long before Storm was staring down at his brother. His arms and legs were sprawled out at his sides. His bed, like Storm's, was a woven mess of grass that he could roll up at his leisure. It was placed just before the fire, directly next to his own. Kaim's wool blanket was halfway across the room, and he was snoring with all the peace of a bear in hibernation. Oi, Kaim, Storm said, but there was no answer. Kaim, Storm tried a second time, but again, there was no answer. Kaim, wake up. We have to go get water and it's already past noon. At this rate, we might not even make it back by dark. No answer. Just pleasant, undisturbed snoring. Letting out a sigh, Storm walked out of the cabin and returned a few minutes later. In his hand, he held a cup full of the last bit of water from the water skins. Splash! Kaim arose in a flurry. Instantly, he was on his feet, looking around at who the culprit was. What the heck, Storm? Kaim yelled. What was that for? His hair was a mess of silver that he soon ruffled away from his eyes. He was still wearing his clothes from the day before, a long white vest and dark gray breeches. Storm looked down at Kaim's feet to find him wearing only one of his sandals. Well, at least he got something off before he fell asleep, Storm thought. Kaim, get ready. We have to get more water before nightfall and it's already afternoon. Both of the water skins are empty, so we both have to go. We don't have time to do the hike either. Kaim's eyes went from sharp to bright and joyous. We get to climb today? It's about time. Kaim eagerly began searching the room for his missing sandal. I've been drinking as much water as possible so that we could climb again. And today's the day. I'm so excited. Storm's eyes narrowed at his brother's enthusiasm. Seriously? I, I hate you right now. Why would you drink all the... Storm shook his head. You know what? Just get up. We leave within a quarter of the shade. There's a few loaves of bread on the table if you want, but we don't have that much food, so try not to eat it all. Otherwise, we'll have to add hunting to our chore list. Storm turned around to leave and stop. And don't eat it all just so we have to go hunting either. Kaim waved his brother away, finding his sandal sitting on top of a bookshelf. Now how'd you go and get up there? He muttered, grabbing it. Kaim walked outside the cabin, stretching his arms up and taking in the beauty of the sky. He walked around the side and found Storm lifting one of the water skins onto his back, strapping it to himself like a backpack. Storm pointed at the other one laying on the ground, motioning to Kaim. Let's go, Kaim. We're making horrible time at this pace. Kaim walked over to his designated water skin and noticed a sheep machete leaning against the wall. He grabbed the machete and tossed it to Storm, who nodded and clipped it onto his belt. And kick off your sandals or you might lose them, Storm added, choosing to go barefoot as well. Soon enough, Kaim and Storm were standing at the precipice of their island, staring across the way at the edge of Folia. The two of them leapt across the hundred foot gap with ease, landing softly on the other side. Walking along the side of the cliff, the boys soon found two coiled bundles of rope attached to anchors at the summit. I'm gonna try the hardest route today, Kaim said, punching his fist into his hand. Storm looked up at Kaim, an uneasy feeling of hesitation coming over him. Storm stared down off the edge of the cliff, his eyes falling on nothing but open sky. Slowly clenching his fist, he could still feel the acute muscle soreness throughout both of his arms. Let's just feel it out when we're down there, said Storm. Sometimes the temperature of the rock isn't right for that kind of climb. Plus, you've been sleeping all morning and I've already finished a thousand weighted slashes. I'm kind of burnt out over here. Kaim laughed. So what you're saying is you don't think you can do it. It's gonna be a sad day for you when I finish the unclimbable climb and you climb the easy one. Guess that'll prove who's stronger after all this time. Storm felt his competitive nature warming his blood. But that also means if I finish the climb after doing sword training all morning, then I'm stronger than you. Nope, doesn't mean that, said Kaim, stretching down and touching his toes. I could do that too. Whatever, said Storm. Are we doing this or not? Kaim and Storm grabbed the ends of each of their own ropes. With a careful nod to one another, they walked back about 20 paces from the cliff before stopping and wrapping the rope a few times around each of their wrists. All right, Kaim, let's... Storm started, but Kaim was already running. Storm watched as Kaim leapt off the cliff with a cry and fell past his line of sight. Storm took a few steady breaths, feeling the sweat beating up in his palms. Shaking away his fear of the 600-foot fall he was about to go through, Storm ran forward and leapt from the edge. Storm felt his body soaring through the air. Grasping the rope tightly between his fingers, he felt it tug and pull back at him. 
The air surged around his body as the floating islands in the sky grew further and further away. Twisting himself in the air, Storm turned his body back to face the underside of Folia. Exhilaration swept through him, diminishing his fears. Before he knew it, a huge smile had come over his face as he raced downwards, the rope swinging him deep under the earthen mass of Folia. Yeah! Kaim screamed as he saw Storm swinging toward him. Kaim was holding on to one of the good holds on the underside of the massive overhang, his other hand waving out towards his brother as his swing began to lift him back up, slowing his momentum. Reaching out his hand, Storm knew he had only one chance to grab the rock or he would swing off of it, forcing him to climb back up the rope to the top and do it all over again. The rock face grew bigger and bigger before his eyes as he searched for a suitable hold to grab onto. Bracing himself, Storm held out his free hand and snagged a jutting flake of stone. His feet touched onto the wall but lost friction, sending a surge of anxiety through his body, but his hand did not let go. Storm hung there for a long moment by one hand, reaching down at the fall below him. There was only sky and clouds. Reaching up with his second hand, Storm found another proper hold and grabbed it. The rock was a little cold despite the sun, and he knew the moment he touched it that it was the perfect condition for climbing. Tightening the muscles in his stomach, Storm raised his feet and put them on the wall. Letting out all the air in his lungs, Storm leaned back, straightening his arms and putting the weight on his tendons. I'm never gonna get tired of doing that, Kaim said, his smile beaming. They hung from a steep overhanging cliff, deep beneath the edge where they had jumped, and they could no longer see their little island or where they had jumped from at all. Storm let one arm hang off the wall as he shook it out, trying to warm up his hands and tendons for the long climb to come. The easy part was finished. Everything would only get harder from there on. All right, we gotta be quick, Storm said, shaking out his other hand. Once we fill up these skins, it will only be a matter of time until our muscles give out from climbing under so much extra weight. For what felt like once in a lifetime, Kaim agreed. He shook out both arms one by one before the both of them released the ropes they had swung from. From there on, there was only one way back up. Don't fall. Kaim and Storm began steadily down climbing the rock face. Each move was slow and meticulous, perfect in its execution. As they climbed lower and lower, the first of many great hanging roots came into view. Before long, they could see hundreds of massive roots, thicker than trees, reaching out from the underside of Folia. When the old man first told me that Folia gets its water from the roots of the great tree, I didn't believe him, said Storm, eyeing his next move. Kaim was a few paces to his side and slightly lower on the climb. Well, I did. He's always right, said Kaim. But even when he told me, I couldn't really imagine what he was saying until I actually saw it for the first time. Yeah, said Storm, stopping. He took in the sight of everything around him. The rock face they were on was fairly steep, with their backs completely exposed to the sky. The hanging roots were gnarled, thick, and long, with several massive leaves growing from the sides of them. Looking for the closest root, Storm set his eyes on one only 20 paces away. Come on, said Storm. That one isn't too far. The two brothers down climbed until they were hanging just next to the root. Looking around for somewhere to jam himself into the rock, Storm was able to place his knee behind a big jut of stone. Locking himself in with the knee bar, Storm took both of his hands off the rock and shook them out one at a time. All right, Storm said to himself, first things first. Kaim climbed over to where he was and began taking turns letting each of his arms rest. He watched as Storm pulled off one of the shoulder straps and loosened the top of the water skin. Holding onto it with one arm, Storm pulled out the machete and cut into the side of the root. As soon as the machete cut through, water began pouring out. Quickly sheathing the machete back to his side, Storm held up the water skin and waited as it filled with water. Ugh, forgot how heavy these things get, Storm muttered as the water skin quickly filled. Feeling the strain in his arm as he held it, Storm waited until it was completely full before he pulled on the tightening string and fastened it. Kaim, come and take this one. This knee bar is solid, so there's no point in losing it. Kaim climbed down to Storm's side and pulled one of his arms out of the straps. Grabbing his own water skin with his free hand, Kaim lifted it up and sunk his teeth into the strap, holding it with his mouth. Nodding his head to Storm, he reached out and took the full one his brother had been holding. Slightly wincing under the weight of it and the lack of his extra hand, Kaim was barely able to slip one of the straps over his shoulder. Just as he reached his free hand back to the rock face, one of his footholds broke, 
sending a shiver of fear through Storm, who had been watching rather apprehensively. Hanging on with one arm under the immense weight, Kaim carefully placed his foot back on the wall. Grabbing the wall with his other hand, Kaim pulled the other strap over his shoulder. He then reached up to the empty water skin in his mouth and held it out to his brother, who was still locked into the knee bar, both his hands hanging idly at his sides. Careful, said Storm, looking at the place where Kaim's foothold had broken. The old man says most of the rock is trustworthy, but there are some sketchy sections. Got it, said Kaim, feeling the weight of the water skin on his back. I'm going to start climbing back up. You all right from here? He looked at his brother, who simply smiled back at him, waving Kaim away. I'll be fine. With a no-hands rest like this, I can take a few minutes, even after I've filled the second skin. Kaim took a few long, deep breaths as he looked up at the different lines of climbing above him. He hung for the better part of a minute as his eyes scanned the rock face. There it is, Kaim finally said. That's the hardest route. Storm turned his head up to where Kaim was looking. Sure enough, it was definitely the hardest climb of the many that ran back up to the edge. Whereas the route they downclimbed was littered with huge handholds, good foot placement, and was relatively easy to follow. The line Kaim was looking at would push their strength to the brink of their limits. Tiny cracks you could barely get a finger into. Footholds no bigger than a fingernail. And even though neither of them would speak of it, the crux of the climb was a devastating move that neither of them had ever done before. Asangate whispered Storm, staring at the line. The touching of earth and sky. At least we know it stays true to its name. He could feel his palms getting clammy just looking at it. You sure you want to do this? About 30 feet under the crux, the rock around the, the route becomes desolate and there's no down climbing beyond that point. There's only one way up through that one. Kaim took a few deep breaths, pounded fists with Storm, and began his ascent. For a minute, Storm sat and watched his brother, his own body hanging nearly upside down on the cliff. His brother moved with the subtle grace of water flowing over rock. There was no jagged movement, no misplacement of his hands or feet, only the tranquil, meditative process of executing each move perfectly. As much as he hated to admit it, nor ever would out loud, Storm knew that his brother was the better technical climber. Storm watched as Kaim climbed out of sight before turning his attention back to the task at hand. He carefully loosened the top of the water skin and felt it fill with water. As it filled, he did not think of the climb to come, nor the fact that he was hanging tens of thousands of feet above a place that nobody in their world had ever seen. He focused on keeping his breathing steady as he watched the water fill. I wonder how many people have to climb up a thousand foot cliff every time they need water, Storm laughed. We're the luckiest ones in Oval Falia, right Kaim? He smirked, thinking of his brother and the strange ways in which he thought. Hoisting the heavy water skin onto his back, Storm looked around for two handholds from which he could unlock his knee. Finding what he was looking for, he set his hands, then placed his right foot carefully into a little crack and pulled his knee free. The old man had told him that Asangate consisted of over a dozen sections, each of which were harder than any of the other climbs heading back up to the summit. Luckily for Storm, he knew that between most of the hard sections were good rest spots where he could recover, at least a little bit. Taking a few deep breaths, Storm began climbing. There was a certain tranquility that came with climbing that could seldom be found in other places. The art of holding on to holds with the tips of his fingers and the incredible focus it took to keep his feet on the wall in the hardest of places was something that had earned Storm's respect. It wasn't like fighting someone with a sword or hunting a beast in the forest. There was no defeating the rock. It was a part of nature that did not fight back against him. Perhaps that's why climbing was so difficult, because it was always a battle with oneself. This inner battle often brought Storm into a state of meditation. There was no adrenaline rush, and if there was, he knew it was only because something might be going wrong. His entire existence rested in the few feet of stone that his hands and feet clung to, and while he climbed, he felt as if he were traveling within a blink of time a place where no other part of the outer world could touch him. Storm did not know how long it was that he climbed before reaching the first good rest point, but by the time he got there and awakened from his momentary trance, all the fatigue that he had been suppressing seemed to hit him on the spot. The weight of the water skin was easily three times his own body weight, which typically would not have been hard for him to climb with had he been climbing an easier route. But add on the fact that he had trained nearly six hours that morning, he could feel his arms burning like oil on flame. Finding a solid hold to rest one of his arms, 
Storm placed his right foot on the wall, balancing himself in such a way that he could turn and look out over the sky. He could barely see the tip of their island above him, and he guessed that he had climbed a good part of the distance to the top. The sun was already in her descent towards the horizon, and he knew that if he didn't pick up the pace, he would be forced to climb in the dark. It was an unsettling thought, one that sent a tremor of fear through his bones. Taking a few minutes of resting each of his arms one by one, Storm began climbing up a thin finger crack. His fingers began to bleed from the sharpness of the stone, and he could feel the warm blood trickling down over his wrists. Yet the more he climbed, the more his body seemed to adapt to what he was putting it through. And although the crack was maybe an inch wide, he could jam his fingers into it in such a way that he wasn't using his muscles to hold up his body. Each solid finger jam locked his hand into a position that only he could get in and out of. It was raw commitment at its finest, and not for the weak of spirit. He knew first and foremost that the climb was not possible if he only relied on his muscle. The only way to get through it was with pure, flawless technique. As he climbed on, Storm began to notice the blankness of the stone at his sides. The line of tiny holes above him became increasingly more apparent, and he knew that he was approaching the crux of the climb. Focusing on the intense burn of his forearms and the numbness of his fingers, he reached for a tiny two-finger pocket and felt it snap off the wall. His stomach leaped into his chest as both his feet cut off in suit. Feeling one of his last four fingers slip off, Storm began to panic. Hanging off the overhang by three fingers, thoughts of falling rushed into Storm's mind with the force of a broken dam. Throwing his right hand up in desperation, he missed the hold, and his body began to swing. The weight of the water skin seemed to grow tenfold under the pressure, and Storm knew that if he didn't calm down, he would surely fall. The fall below never looked so terrifying in his life. Trying to steady his swing, Storm took several deep breaths and closed his eyes. He knew that because of the tininess of the holes, he could not dynamically swing up and grab it. Opening his eyes, Storm twisted around and was able to get the tip of his right foot on the wall. Pushing into the speck of a foothold with everything he had, Storm reached up with his hand and realized the hold he was going for was only big enough for a single finger. Sinking his middle finger into it, he stabilized his swing and carefully placed his left foot back on the wall. At that point, all thoughts vanished from Storm's mind. His body was on the brink of exhaustion, and even if he could think, he could not have fathomed how he continued to climb. One grueling move at a time, Storm crawled up the face until finally, one of his hands sunk completely into a jutting piece of stone. Letting out all of his breath, Storm realized he had stopped breathing up until that point. Relaxing as much as he could, Storm shook out his left arm, but no matter how long he rested it, the strength of holding up all his weight from earlier could not be recovered. If it had been anything other than his strong arm, he would have likely fallen. The blood on his fingers and hands had dried, and for the first time since he started climbing, he felt the wind comb through his hair. It was cold and his eyes widened. Turning around slowly, Storm could see the underside of his island about 200 feet above, but it did not console him. Beyond his floating home, he could see the sun sinking into the last layer of clouds on the horizon, and the light with which he climbed would soon be diminished. Anger began to flow into him. Why had the old man told him to climb down and get water when he knew he had been training all morning? Why had Kaim wanted to do the hardest line on the day he was most worn out? He found himself clenching his teeth, cursing both the old man and his brother for leading him to this cruel, painful place. Stop, he said suddenly. This isn't anyone's fault but your own. You chose this route. You chose to compete with Kaim even though you were tired, and now you're trying to blame everyone else for your own weakness. Storm let out a breath of air. My weakness, he muttered. No, I refuse to be weak. But no matter how hard he tried to boost his own confidence with his words, he knew they were lies. He had never felt weaker in his life, and the realization crushed his spirit. Oi! A scream echoed across the sky, lifting Storm's eyes. Oi, Storm! It was the voice of Kime screaming out from above him. You're a beast, Kaim roared. I can't believe you. I can't believe you're doing that after training all morning. I'm so tired I can barely move, but I made it now and now we're all waiting for you. You can do it. Without knowing how or why, Storm felt the words of his brother rekindle his spirit. The water skin on his back suddenly felt lighter and he found himself grinning. For a second, he had forgotten what it felt like to be truly pushed to his limit. It was a terrifying place but one that he knew he had survived through before. 
Pushing off his feet to the next hold, Storm continued climbing, ignoring the pain that screamed throughout his body. As the last bits of light were shedding off the rock face, Storm came upon the crux. Looking up at it, he had never been so intimidated by a climbing move in his life. He had come to two decent hand holds with a high right foot, but the next hold was nearly two body lengths above him. It was an absurd dino, the type of move that would involve a leap of faith from one hold to the next. It would be a test of everything he had, commitment, strength, precision. Even the tiniest bit of hesitation would result in a horrifying fall. Storm knew that with the added weight of the water skin, the dynamic movement would slightly throw his body out of whack. He would have to rest all the weight of the water skin on his shoulders and have it sit there as he pushed himself up and leapt off the rock. If the water skin lifted off his back for even a split second while he was jumping, the weight of it would pull him down in the air and he would not make it. Everything would have to be perfect. He ran through the move over and over in his head, mentally practicing for his one determinating moment. The hard pull on his hands followed by the point and press of his right foot and finally the jump. Taking one last chance to shake out each of his arms, he knew that even if he made the dyno, the movement itself would cost his strength dearly. After the leap, it would be nothing but a final scramble to the summit where any mistake could no longer be compensated by his strength. Focusing all his focus into the tip of his right toe, Storm began to rock himself in a smooth circular motion. Feeling the moment upon him, Storm screamed, wrenching up off his toes and felt himself soaring through the air. His entire body was off the wall and he realized that he hadn't jumped far enough to get both hands on the hold. Reaching up with everything he had, Storm grasped the jut of rock. Everything in his body tried to force him to let go, but he would not. Storm's legs swung out from beneath him until he was completely horizontal in the air. He could feel his fingers slipping, and at the peak of his swing, he repositioned them in a split-second move that allowed him to get his full grip on the stone. Before he knew it, Storm's feet had swung back to the wall and he, had, and he had his left hand matched next to his right. His breathing was calm and he blinked a couple times before the completion of the move finally hit him. Leaning back on his arms, Storm roared up at the darkening skies. Feeling the strength of his voice fuel his drive, Storm made his way into the last vertical crack that would lead to the summit. It wasn't long before the sun had completely set, his eyes no longer a factor in helping him. Deciding to close them and focus purely on instinct, Storm inched his way up the crack one move at a time until he could no longer distinguish the fact that time was passing at all. The crack began to widen as he got higher, a little at first, but it was a world of difference. What felt like days later, Storm felt his weary hand reach up and touch the warm rock at the tip of the edge. It was warm, surprisingly, but it could not have felt more comforting to him. With the utmost care, Storm placed his left foot on the last good hold beneath him and swung his right foot over the top of the cliff, digging his heel into solid rock. Storm mantled his body up and onto the ledge where he immediately collapsed. Rolling out of the straps of the water skin, Storm could only feel the weight of his smile. Without any thought of his ascent, Storm laid there on the tip of the cliff and closed his eyes. It felt like an eternity of lying on the cliff before he felt someone gently shaking his shoulder. Wearily opening his eyes, Storm looked up at Kaim, a look of sincere joy upon his brother's face. Kaim kneeled down to, next to him and waited as Storm continued to lie there, breathing heavily. When his lungs finally calmed, Storm stirred and sat up. That's the hardest thing I've ever had to do, Kaim said, looking out over the sky. Storm stood to his feet. You're telling me. Kaim stood up and reached out his bloody hand. Here, I can take the water skin back. <laughs> you look like death. But Storm shook his head and looked over at their cabin. It's all right. I want to finish this myself. He reached down and restrapped the water skin to his back. Tapping his toes to the ground and feeling out his legs, Storm judged the distance of the jump and the weight of his fatigue. Bracing himself with a steady breath, he leapt across the sky and landed on the grass of their island. Not too far from the tree, Ronan had built a fire and was sitting with his eyes closed next to it. Storm said nothing as he walked around the side of the cabin and reattached the water skin back to its rightful place. Coming back around the corner, he saw Kaim sitting down next to Ronan. Tied to a spit above the fire was a huge slab of meat, roasting pleasantly. Kaim, Storm said, throwing on his jacket, don't drink all the water this time. I don't know how long it's gonna be before I recover enough to do that again. Maybe not ever. With a sudden feeling of lightheadedness, 
Storm eased himself into a sitting position by the fire. He could feel his hands shaking and tried to calm himself with his breathing. Kaim laughed and Ronan opened his eyes. Oh, you're awake, Kaim said, looking at his grandfather. I'm awake, said Ronan. He looked at Storm. How do you feel? Storm tried to focus on the question, but could not. Looking down at his hands, he opened them slowly before curling them into fists. Trying to think back on the climb, Storm realized he could hardly remember what had happened. Everything that he had done felt like a dream, or fragments of a dream that had already escaped his memory. Ronan laughed. That's the best answer you could have given me. Come, let me see your eyes. Storm looked up at Ronan, who nodded. Those are the eyes of someone who's truly alive. What you're feeling right now is a heightened state of being, one that only comes with being pushed to the absolute brink of your limits. Both of you should be proud. Few go to that place and return from it. It was nothing, said Storm, feeling the warmth of his grandfather's words. It was a rare moment to have the old man compliment either of them. He held out his hands before the fire. Ronan watched as the flames danced. Enjoy this moment, because what you just fought through is not even close to the hardest thing you'll ever have to do. Storm's eyes glanced up nervously at his grandfather. Kaim looked at their old man skeptically before his expression changed. Nah, Grandpa, tell us a story. Storm pushed away Ronan's mysterious foreshadowing and rested his arms behind his head. He relished in the heat of the flames, feeling them as if it were the first time he had known fire. A story, said Ronan, stroking his beard. I actually heard quite a good one in town recently. Kaim's eyes brightened and Storm looked up. Ronan poured himself a cup full of wine and took a long drink. It's called The Tale of Fenrir. <laughs>